This is Nightline. I'm Brandon Wong. The top stories. Tun Dr. Mahathir says he expects to remain PM for some three years. And coroner rules Adib's death was not an accident. Morning. To Dr. Mahathir Mohamad said he would stay in office for not more than three years and remained adamant about resigning before the next general election. The Prime Minister said he needed to accomplish a few things before making way for his successor. I promise I would step down before the next election uh-huh. and give, uh, give way to another candidate. So I may have um, at the most three years perhaps. The Prime Minister said this at a dialogue event held at the Council on Foreign Relations in New York on Thursday. Tun Dr. Mahathir, who is 94 years old, came to power for the second time following Pakatan Harapan Coalition's victory in the last general election. Uh, I would like to. At another event, Tun Dr. Mahathir touted Malaysia's business friendly stance as he went about courting U.S. investors to the country on Thursday. He said Malaysia is still the same country that was once business friendly, which encouraged foreign direct investment and grew on the basis of such investments. A lot of foreign investors uh, uh, pull out and uh, come down. Uh, uh, a lot, and we need to resuscitate that. And for that, of course, we, uh, we need to en- ensure people that Malaysia is in a position to recover. Uh, we have put in place all the necessary uh, instruments, and uh, we are managing the finances uh, quite well because uh, we uh, thought that we might go bankrupt, but uh, we are not bankrupt. We are. We still have money, and we are still growing at four and a half percent per year. He said this at a meeting with members of the U.S. ASEAN Business Council and U.S. Chamber of Commerce. Besides being business friendly, he said that investors could expect a country that would be listening to the private sector. Tun Dr. Mahathir also noted that Malaysia was getting a lot of investments from abroad and hopes that more investors would follow suit. Police will take appropriate action to investigate and identify the persons responsible for the death of firefighter Mohammad Adib Mohammad Qasim. Inspector General of Police Tantri Abdul Hamid Bado said he would hold discussions with his officers in Bukit Aman to determine whether to recall some individuals who had been previously detained in connection with the case. Speaking to reporters after officiating the Royal Malaysia Police Innovation Day in Aral Perlis, the IGP said prior to the inquest, police found that they did not have enough evidence for prosecution and will now relook the matter following the inquest. He was asked to comment on the Shah Alam coroner's court's inquest verdict, which established that Adib, 24, died after he was assaulted by two or three unidentified people during a riot in the vicinity of a Hindu temple in Subang Jaya last year. The coroner's court also concluded that the failure of the police and the Federal Reserve Unit personnel in controlling the riot also contributed to his death. Asked about the findings, Dadusri Abdul Hamid said he would identify whether the police standard operating procedure, SOP, in controlling riots was complied with during the incident. Boleh disemak mengapa SOP tidak diikuti? SOP itu tak perlu nak ubah dah, dah memang ada dah, cukup. Cukup. Siapa pegawai pemerintahnya, itu yang pentingnya, ya. Warga PDRM ni bersedia untuk nak bekerja tetapi kalau komandernya tak memberikan perintah dia orang tak keluar atau dia orang tak buatlah kerja tu. SOP dah ada. Saya tak nampak apa perlunya SOP tu di diubah. Saya rasa saya yakin SOP tu mantap. Memang cukup. Earlier, Coroner Rafia Muhammad said the testimonies of witnesses who were present at the scene during the riot were among the factors considered in unravelling what could have happened to Muhammad Adib.
The witnesses included, among others, a retired soldier, Mohammad Hafizan Nordin, 33, Malaysian Civil Defence Force APM volunteer, Ar Narish, 30, and a contractor, S. Suresh, 33. When announcing her decision, Coroner Rofia Muhammad said the 10th witness, Muhammad Hafizan, who had accidentally driven his Mitsubishi Storm into the riot area, told the court that he wanted to make a U-turn after seeing a group of individuals in the area. The witness told the court that the woman told him not to pass by the temple for fear that he might be beaten up. In addition, she said Suresh, who was the eighth witness, saw acts such as hitting, kicking and stomping on a subject surrounded by a group of 20 to 30 men. Coroner Rufia said Suresh also told the court that he heard words like don't hit, why do you want to beat up a fireman in Tamil. Besides that, she said Muhammad Adib also informed Subang Jaya Fire and Rescue Station Chief Said Shahril Anwar Said Sulaiman, 39, that he was dragged out of the Emergency Medical Rescue Services EMRS van before being beaten. Muhammad Adib, who was a member of the EMRS Subang Jaya Fire and Rescue Station, sustained serious injuries during a commotion at the Sri Mahamariamam Temple in USJ 25 on November the 27th last year. After fighting for his life for 21 days, Muhammad Adib succumbed to his injuries on December the 17th. The inquest proceedings over the death of Muhammad Adib began on February the 11th, with 30 witnesses called to give their statements, including several expert witnesses. Meanwhile, Deputy Prime Minister Datu Sri Dr. Wan Aziza Wan Ismail has urged all parties to respect the verdict in the inquest into the death of Muhammad Adib. She said the public should remain calm and not play up racial issues in the verdict of the inquest. Ini adalah bukan satu kes rasis ya, uh, racial ya. Ini kalau salah salah, salah. Kalau bukan kerana oh, orang ni beris uh, uh, macam kita semua Malaysians. Tapi kita nak juga memang uh, uh, keadilan untuk uh, adib lah, ya, arwah adib. Itu yang kita, jangan jadikan ini race, race base or anything. A criminal is a, a crime is a crime. And bukan kerana you are Malay or an Indian or Chinese, they are all Malaysians, we have, to have our country taken care of. Itu satunya. Satunya yang satu lagi adalah untuk kita calm, jangan kita insight salah satu. Jangan jadi politik apa-apa <coughs> isu ini. Datu Sri Dr. Wan Aziza said this to reporters after launching the Rahma Carnival at Dataran Putrajaya on Friday. <laughs> Meanwhile, Asma Aziz, the mother of the late Muhammad Adib, said she was grateful for the decision by the coroner's court and hoped that his killers would be caught soon. She and her husband, Muhammad Qasim Abdul Hamid, were supposed to be in court on Friday to hear the results, but had cancelled their plans as they feared it would not have gone in their favour. After hearing the results, tears flowed freely for her. <laughs> The couple thanked all those who had prayed for them and gave them words of encouragement. Muhammad Qasim also visited the grave of his son at the Masjid Kampung the Bengkau graveyard in Kuala Kuda after Friday prayers. The free water program enjoyed by Selangor residents since 2010 will end in March next year. It will be rebranded as the Darul Esan Water Scheme, targeting those with a household income of 4,000 ringgit and below. In a statement on Friday, Slango Mantribasa Amiruddin Shari said the decision to review the free water program was due to the increase in population every year, which posed a significant impact on the state's financial position. For apartment dwellers with shared meters, the eligibility requirements are the same, but the application must be approved by the building's joint management body. Applications can be made online via the Selangor government portal or downloading the Darul Esan Water Scheme form at the IM Selangor website. Registration starts on Monday until December 31st, and applicants will know the status of the application before the end of February next year. For now, until March the 1st, all 1.6 million account holders in the state will continue to enjoy the 20 cubic meter water rebate.
The Women, Family and Community Development Ministry is set to roll out an action plan that promotes gender equality in the country. Its Minister Industry, Dr. Wan Aziza Wan Ismail, said the gender mainstreaming framework would be adopted by all government bodies. It's very important to have my gender mainstreaming because these policies uh, uh, affect men, women, family. So all ministries must take a note of this and actually we have this together with the KPWKM, KM, our ministry and UNDP, United Nations Development uh, uh, Programme, uh, to implement, to evaluate, to evaluate our national action plan for women for the investment of women, that's how one done the gather. Datuk Sri Dr. Wan Aziza said this to reporters after launching a World Bank report on creating better economic opportunities for women in Putrajaya on Friday. She said the evaluation for the proposed framework had been completed last March and was all set to be launched soon. The action plan would recommend how to integrate gender perspectives and targets into all planning and budgeting. This will be done by emphasizing on sex desegregated data, which will play a key role in this matter. In Selangor, a factory operator was charged at the Pataling Jaya Magistrates Court on Friday with murdering his ex wife at an apartment in Prima Damansara on September the 10th. No plea was recorded from Zulkifli Jonet when the charge was read out before Magistrate Muhammad Ikhwan Hakim. If found guilty, the accused will face the mandatory death penalty. The court has fixed November 22nd for re-mention of the case. Three men have been arrested for allegedly posting seditious and sensitive statements on social media in connection with the Amok incident in Bayan Lebas, Pulau Pinang on Monday. Bukit Aman CID Deputy Director DCP Dr. Muhammad Zuraidi Ibrahim said the suspects aged between 28 and 42 were detained in Pulau Pinang and Kedah. They are expected to be remanded to assist investigations under the Penal Code and the Communications and Multimedia Act. A man was killed after being run down by an express bus while trying to seek help when his car broke down along the North-South Expressway near Sungai Bulo, Salamu on Friday. In the 1.10 a.m. incident, the victim was walking towards another car which stopped by the highway roadside to help before he was hit by the bus and dragged for some 20 meters. The bus also crashed into the car which had stopped over. It is understood that the 15 passengers and the bus driver and the driver of the other car escaped unhurt. Media Prima Burhad organized an awareness program at Taman Upcycle in Banda Pedra, Pulau Pinang, as part of its Corporate Social Responsibility CSR initiative. The program was held in collaboration with the Sebrang Prize City Council and Western Digital to forge closer ties with residents prior to the Jom Hebo Carnival this weekend. Media Prima's chairman, Datu Said Hussein al Junid said the group was synonymous with CSR programs, having previously helped natural disaster victims, assisting homeless people, and also providing medical aid to the less fortunate, including children. At the event, Media Prima contributed 80 Taiwanese cups, which were released into a nearby pond, and also joined in tree planting activities to beautify the area. Taman Upcycle, also known as Upcycle Park, is a 10,000 square meter park, unique in the sense that it was built using recycled material. Meanwhile, MBSP Mayor Datu Rosali Mohammed lauded the CSR program, saying it would help to beautify the re recreational park and create a more natural and pleasant environment for the residents. The fifth generation of the iconic Supra finally lands in Malaysia. Stay tuned for Nightline's auto segment. Welcome back. Toyota has launched the all-new A90 Toyota GR Supra, one of the most anticipated sport cars to arrive on Malaysian shores this year. The GR Supra returns to the global sports market after production for the previous generation ceased 17 years ago in 2002. One Izul Islam finds out more.
welcome to this week's auto segment with me, One Izzul Islam. Now this beautiful car you see next to me is the latest addition to Toyota, the A90 Toyota GR Supra. Collaborating with BMW, this is the fifth generation of this iconic nameplate. Let's go find out more. The new Toyota Supra was developed based on a sports car collaboration with BMW's Z4. Both car makers agreeing to similar fundamental platform specifications. In line with Toyota's aim to make ever better cars, the engineers have provided a truly emotional experience for the drivers. This includes parts from the exhaust sound which strengthens the car's character but also enhances the whole driving experience. The sound of Supra is organic and not manufactured. So it's not the same sound every time you lift off the structural for the GL Supra. Improvement after improvement was done towards this Supra to meet expectation and provide true driving satisfaction for the driver. The legend is back. Packed with a 3-litre turbocharged inline six-cylinder engine, the Supra produces 335 horsepower from 5,000 to 6,500 RPM and 500 newton meters of torque from 1,600 to 4,500 RPM. Drive to the rear wheels is through an eight-speed sports-tuned automatic transmission with launch control that enables the Supra to go from zero to 100 kilometers per hour in just 4.3 seconds. Three, two, one, go. All right, now we're going to try zero to 100 in 4.3 seconds. There we go, 100. I think that was less. car is outfitted with Brembo brake systems along with lightweight 19-inch forged alloy rims with Michelin Pilot Super Sport tires and adaptive variable suspension. Its interior has 8-way powered seats with the driver's side memory, black leather upholstery, carbon fiber trim and an 8.8-inch touchscreen infotainment system. Safety features of the Supra include seven airbags, stability and traction control, ABS with EBD, and brake assist. The all new fifth generation Supra in Malaysia offers only one variant, the GTS, which is priced from 568,000 ringgit on the road without insurance. One is the Islam for Nightline's auto segment, TV Tiga. Saudi Arabia to offer tourist visas for the first time. The details after this break. And it's on to our foreign segment. Two Rohingya refugees were killed in a gun battle with Bangladeshi border guards as they tried to cross into Bangladesh from Myanmar on Friday. According to authorities, the incident occurred on the banks of the Naf River near Cox Bazaar in the early hours of Friday when a group of Rohingya claimed to be drug smugglers were crossing the river by boat. The guards then signaled the boats to stop before they jumped onto the bank and tried to flee, prompting the guards to open fire. Two of them were later found dead, while three others managed to escape. The deceased were identified as 22-year-old Dil Ahmed and Dos Muhammad, 19, from Mugdo town in Rakhine state of Myanmar. Saudi Arabia has thrown open its doors to foreign tourists as it unveiled a new visa regime for visitors from 49 countries around the world in a bid to draw foreign companies to invest in the country's tourism sector. According to its tourism chief, Ahmed Al-Khatib, 38 countries in Europe, 7 in Asia, as well as the US, Canada, Australia and New Zealand will be eligible to apply for the new visas.
He said the visas will be available online for about 80 US dollars, with no restrictions for unaccompanied women as in the past, adding that access to the Muslim holy cities of Mecca and Medina remained restricted. Al Khatib also said the kingdom will also ease its, restrict, its strict dress code for foreign women, allowing them to go without the abaya robe that is still mandatory public wear for Saudi women. Foreign women, however, will be required to wear modest clothing, including at public beaches. And that's it for Nightline this time around. As we wrap, let's take a look at Swiss climber Danny Arno sets a new free solo speed record for climbing the Domici di Mai route in Italy. In near perfect weather conditions, the 35-year-old completed the 550-meter long climb in 46 minutes and 30 seconds, beating the previous best by almost 19 minutes. I'm Brandon Wong. Thank you for tuning in and enjoy your weekend.